Gospel of Luke, chapter number 10. The Gospel of Luke, chapter number 10. I'm going to have you kind of keep track of that place. Luke, chapter number 10. I'm going to have you just put your Baptist bookmark, that's your finger, uh, in that spot. I'm going to have you look up also 1 Chronicles, chapter 17. I'm going to do that so we can go quickly from one to the other to read two passages of Scripture back to back uh, without a lot of extra time looking uh, for uh, for the uh, the other verses. And so in uh, in First Chronicles chapter number 18, excuse me, chapter 17, I'm sorry, I sent you the wrong chapter, but not far, far off. First Chronicles chapter 17 and verse number 16. David has become king. He's been anointed so. There, are, there have been ceremonies. There have been, uh, a, uh, the beginning of the chapter covers God's covenant with David. And then in uh, chapter 17, you get to verse number 16, and the Bible simply says this, And David the king came and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is mine house that thou hast brought me hitherto? Who am I, and what is my house that thou hast brought me hitherto? But in this passage of Scripture, David as king, I want you to see here, came and sat before the Lord. Now go with me to Luke chapter number 10. And beginning in verse number 38, the Bible says, came to pass, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him, into her house, and she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And and Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. This passage in Luke chapter number 10 is probably, you might be thinking, so well known that uh, we don't even have to read uh, the passage, just reference it. But I find that there are often uh, some people that aren't as familiar with it as others. I remember one time I was preaching and I made mention of a biblical account that I said, you all know the story of, and I just mentioned it. And after the service, a man came up and said, uh, you know, you said this, you know the story of. And he said, I, I don't know the story of. What's the story of? And tell me, tell me what happened there, because I didn't get any of that. And I'm, I'm uh, constantly reminded that uh, sometimes, you know, people are at a different place in their spiritual growth. Uh, maybe some saved a long time, maybe some saved more recently, but our knowledge certainly of the Bible and biblical accounts varies, and so I want to be careful not to make assumptions. David as king, as the newly minted king of Israel, came and sat before the Lord. And here Mary, uh, as she enters, as Jesus entered into the house of Mary and Martha, the Bible says Martha is running around, as you might imagine, if if, uh, the Lord came to your house and and you'd be running around trying to make sure everything was, you know, it'd be the fastest spring cleaning in history. You know, Jesus is at the door. You might leave him standing there for a few minutes just so you can, uh, you know, kind of clean up a little bit and and, uh, scurrying around trying to make sure everything is right. And Mary is just sitting at the feet of Jesus. uh, uh, Martha complains a little bit about that. Jesus commends Mary and says she has chosen the better part. I want to preach a couple of times recently on our labor for the Lord. But I want to take a step back from that and remind, have us be reminded today uh, of this one thought. Worship must come before work. Worship must come before work. We could also say that love 
should precede labor. Now, Mary sat at Jesus' feet. David, as king, sat at Jesus' feet. And in bringing these two references together, we are, uh, we are advancing the notion here that uh, the suggestion that, our, that uh, the order of things for the adult or mature Christian life should be that our labor comes from our love or our work comes from our worship for the Lord. Uh, the, there are two places uh, where we sit before the Lord. We sit before the Lord privately when we are alone, when we uh, spend time with Him in His Word and in prayer. And then we also sit before the Lord publicly when we meet with God's people. It is often called a worship service. Very often, very, uh, a very little worship actually happens. A lot of what is passes for worship is not biblical worship. Biblical worship, if you find someone worshiping in the Bible, uh, you're probably going to find them in posture on their face because that's the biblical posture of worship. And these two are sitting at the feet of Jesus. You know, uh, Jesus often had sharp words of rebuke for religious people but he never had a sharp word of rebuke for somebody sitting at his feet. Those that would sit at the feet of Jesus and anoint his feet for his coming crucifixion, uh, death, and burial, Jesus had no rebuke for them. Jesus did not rebuke Mary. He has no rebuke for those who would sit at his feet. We need to deliberately, regularly, frequently sit at the feet of Jesus. We are constant in our hurrying around and service for God and rushing about to make sure that we are on time for our class and this and that. And there's nothing wrong with that. I don't want to uh, say that working for God is not important. But it, it is something that ought to happen naturally because of our love for the Lord. Many years ago, there's a, a, I think, very famous sermon by Dr. Jack Hiles that simply entitled Duty. Duty. And he talks about, some of you might have heard that over the years. I, I've heard it, I don't know how many times over the years, uh, on the Christian duty that we, uh, we do have, owe a duty to the Lord. And he's not wrong about that. He's not wrong about that. Don't, don't misunderstand that I want to be critical today. I don't. There's also uh, another sermon that, that uh, was recommended to me and, uh, by a, a, another national, nationally known preacher. And the title of the sermon, and I, I, again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it to you, but I'm going to also give the benefit of the doubt. The title of the sermon was Fake It Till You Make It. And uh, I'm going to give the benefit of the doubt that it, the intention of the sermon was not as it sounds. Uh, I don't believe, in other words, I don't believe that the uh, preacher was trying to get people to do something insincere. I think he was trying to say, uh, do what you're supposed to do until you fall in love with the one you're supposed to be doing it for. And so giving the benefit of the doubt, I don't think either one intended the wrong thing. As a matter of fact, there is a principle there that is a life principle or a life truth. And that is that very often we learn to obey before we want to obey. Amen? As children growing up, we learned it's right to obey, and we obeyed because of consequences if we did not obey, or because we were told it's simply right to obey long before love compelled us to obey. But it is and should be the natural process of maturing and growing that at some point we are no longer made to obey, we want to obey. Duty will only take you so far. Responsibility will only take you so far. And let me say this, that and we can apply this, and just by way of introduction, if I, because I want, to be, I want to be clear. I want you to understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying, well, if you don't feel like it, 
he ought not do it. No, we ought to do what's right to do, whether we feel like it or not. But there ought to come a time, there needs to come a time in a Christian's life where he does so because he loves the Lord, not simply because it's time to do it. That we are in God's house because we desire to please God and we want to hear from God, not simply because the pastor will be looking for us if we don't. There comes a time in, in our life where duty will only carry us so far. And so, and I believe, again, giving the benefit of the doubt, that both of those sermons I referenced were really with that intention. That, look, you know, we, we owe God a debt, and we do. But there comes a time, um, you know, growing up as a child, I was not the most obedient nor compliant child. You might, uh, you might agree with some who said, out of our family, I was the black sheep. And, uh, and I couldn't disagree with you if you made that claim. But there came a, there came a time in, in my growth as a young adult that I came to appreciate my father and mother and reverencing them became a matter of love for them rather than responsibility to them. And so it is true that, that uh, many times we grow in the Christian life and we learn what we are supposed to do and very often, we do not yet understand the love that motivates it. And we learned, the more we learn about God and his sacrifice for us, the more deeply we love God, and no longer do we have to do it, we want to do it. It's kind of the natural way of life. It is the natural way of life in service to our country. That duty will only get you so far. Now let me, and let me make this statement. Duty will never take you as far as love will take you. You will always go farther for love than you will for duty. In, in, you know, the, as in, the, in the military, a soldier will do his duty. But doing his duty will take him so far but not as far as that soldier who loves his country, who loves uh, the United States of America, who loves our nation, who loves our freedoms, who loves our liberty, who loves what the nation stands for. And though that, that love will take him farther than a soldier that is merely doing his duty. Now, do your duty, but understand that it's only going to take you so far, not as far as love. Family. Many times people will do their duty to their family. That'll only take them so far. But if there's love involved, they'll go much farther for love than they will for duty. You find it when you end up uh, trying to do some marital counseling with a couple and by the time they get to the pastor's office and it's all about, well, he's supposed to do this and she's supposed to do that and more focused on the other one's responsibilities than their own. And when that's, when that's happening, it's all about responsibility. It's not about love. And love will always take you farther than responsibility will in the family. It'll also, it's also applicable to God's house. Love will take us farther than responsibility. It'll take us farther than duty in our, in our walk with God, in our relationship with God. And so, yes, duty... But duty should grow into love. Yes, we ought to do what we're supposed to do. But at some point, we ought to get to the place where the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus, by the way, say, well, the love of Christ constrains us. You can say the love of Christ just constrains you. No, no, no. Don't forget the rest of the verse. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. In other words, when you start to understand that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. That means the world is without Christ and on its way to hell. And the love of Christ begins to grip us and constrain us and press us into service because of love. Not simply because it is the commission of the church. Therefore, we have to do it. That will only take you so far. And so this, this idea of worship before work becomes important. Now, if you're not to the place where you love God as you should, it doesn't mean you ought not serve him. 
because he's still the Lord. But our desire is to get to the place where we grow in our love for Christ to where we desire to sit at his feet. There are three things that sitting at the feet of Jesus suggests for us. First of all, it suggests a peace or relaxation. It suggests that we are not hurried, nor are we worried. The Lord's servants know how to take comfort in the presence of our God. When we get to the place where we are sitting at Jesus' feet, and, and as if you want to say it this way by application, when we are uh, hearing his word, we are sitting at his feet. We are learning from him. We are trying to do our best to be worshipful about him, to exalt him. And he, as he is exalted, we are abased. We are, we are humbled. And the, listen, the more truly you see how, how infinite he is, you get a sense of your finiteness. You start to learn how little it is that you really understand and know. And so there is a peace, there is a, a relaxation physically, mentally, but above all spiritually. Some say that, talk about the, the secret of good health is when we are not stressed. Stress is supposed to be one of the, the leading factors of, of hypertension and high blood pressure and and, uh, and I, I guess I'm always uh, kind of stressed. Um, uh, I don't know that I'm distressed, but I'm always, I, I'm, uh, my, my children said I, I am intense. Sometimes I'm a little intense. Uh, but, but it's true of us spiritually that when we begin to learn that what it means to sit at Jesus' feet and not just labor for him, labor for him, labor for him, but we learn to love him as we should and listen to him as we should and learn from him as we should, uh, then we begin to relax at his feet. In other words, well, let me just illustrate it this way. I have a pastor friend that uh, by his own testimony, that he, he uh, the, the great majority of his Christian life, he lived stressed about possible sin in his life. He said he didn't know of any sin, but he stressed out over the possible sin that he was unaware of. And he was so stressed about it, he would spend hours in prayer asking God to show him a uh, sin that he... Well, listen... You, you don't have to beg God to show you your sin. It's kind of his job. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, amen, to bring us under conviction. And when he reveals something to you, it's time to do something about it. We need to be as open with God as we can be. We need to not shut God off and say, well, we don't want to hear. But trust me, if there's something God wants you to deal with, the Holy Spirit of God is going to use His Word as the, the, the two-edged sword that it is and do work in your heart and bring you under conviction. If we spend as much time dealing with what we do know instead of stressing about what we don't know, we'd be a lot farther along in our Christian life. By His own admission, He spent uh, years and years, even as a pastor, stressing over any he, he, he said I, I would I would spend hours and come up with nothing and I would just know that there must be something there must be something he finally got but his pendulum swung too far the other way and he swung all the way over to kind of the the idea that well everything we've ever done or ever will do it's already taken care of so I don't have to even think about it now wait a minute you know, we're still supposed to confess our sins daily to the Lord. We're supposed, still supposed to bring our, bring our, our request to him, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We're still supposed to get daily cleansing. If we, uh, if we let the Lord uh, wash our feet, amen, uh, from the, the, the illustration of the daily uh, uh, dirt that we come in contact with. And so we need to uh, be mindful of the fact that sitting at the feet of Jesus brings a relaxation. Number two, it speaks of submission. Submission. In the case of David, 
and Mary, their attitude of sitting before the Lord indicated a submissive attitude. They were at his feet. At whose feet? At the feet of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. At the feet of their sovereign. At the feet of the God of the universe. How great he is. How small we are. Our great need is to get to a place of submission to God where we recognize his majesty, his holiness, and yield completely to his authority in our lives. The truth of the matter is, we treat God often as an employer that we're going to get away with as much as we can get away with. As long as he's looking over our shoulder, we might just do what we're supposed to do. But a lot of Christians do not realize there's never a shoulder God's not looking over. And we think that being out of sight of the church is being out of sight of God. We think that being out of sight of the preacher is being out of sight of God. Or being out of sight of parents is being out of sight of God. And so children, kids, teenagers will sometimes gather and involve themselves and say things they ought not say because they they think well now no one knows listen that's uh, we treat god as if as if he's not worthy of our worship to sit at the feet of jesus means that we are submissive to his authority in our life and we want what he what he has for us and then i believe that number three sitting at the feet of jesus shows expectation. When David and Mary sat before the Lord, they were expecting something to happen. And of course it did. You, When you sit at the feet of Jesus, you hear from him. He, he ministers to you. He instructs you. Sitting in the presence of the king makes us to where we are never the same, quite the same again. When Isaiah went into the presence of the Lord, his life was completely changed. Look with me in Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. And in verse number 1, the Bible says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. I don't know if this is exactly all that it means, but I think implied is as long as Uzziah, the king, was there, it obscured in some way his view of the Lord. And when Uzziah was taken out of the way, he saw also the Lord. You know, many times there are things that block our view of the Lord. Our, our confidence is in our, in our possessions. Our confidence is in our job, our security, our retirement, whatever else it might be, some position that we have. Our security is in those things. And it sometimes can block our view of the Lord. In other words, we're trusting things other than the Lord. And not sometimes until those things are removed do we really see the Lord as we should. How did he see the Lord? He saw him sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. And with twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him. They cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then, one, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Oh, there's so much here that I don't have time to go through. Don't miss that when the Lord spoke, he said, Who will go for 
us. The us there is the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We are not, he was not sending someone in the name of God and the angels. It was God, the Godhead. And the Bible says here when he saw, when the King Uzziah was no longer in the picture, he saw the Lord. He describes him as, and then I saw the King of Kings, the Lord of hosts. I've seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Verse number five. Hey, there was another king that was blocking the view. When that was taken out of the way, he said, now I've seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Notice what happened. There was an inward change. He said, then said I, I am, woe is me, for I am a man of, uh, I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. There was an inward change. His view of God changed his view of himself. When we get a view of who God really is, it gives us a new perspective on who we are. We uh, think we are something until we begin to see God and who he is, and we realize we are nothing. And then the Bible says, God cleansed his speech and said, who will go for us? God changed not only his view of himself, but God changed his role, his responsibility. You see, everything changed when Isaiah saw the Lord. And with us, I wonder if we lack the change of Isaiah because we have yet to see the Lord high and lifted up. We have yet to really get a good view of him and his holiness, of him and his omnipotence, of the infiniteness of God, uh, of his, of, of his, of his, uh, 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 his omniscience and his omnipresence and everything about him and his purpose in my life. The more we see that, the more we yield to it. There's a transformation and expectation that sitting at the feet of Jesus causes us to change. We ought to ask ourselves a question, Christian. This is a question for each one, not for one to look at another, but for us to look at ourselves. And if we examine ourselves and we see really not much a change in our service for Christ over the years. That we're not doing more for Christ than we used to. That we're not more faithful to him and his house than we used to be. That we're not more diligent in the word of God than we used to be and not spending more time in prayer. If there is no growth, I wonder if we're really missing the view of God. Now listen, it is part of what I think is the responsibility of preaching the word of God to constantly challenge us to do more for God and to walk with God more. It is not, it is not my, you know, it is not my purpose to constantly just make people feel good about where we are because none of us are where we ought to be. The truth is that's for any one of us. Sometimes people just want to comfort people. I, uh, one preacher said his responsibility was to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comforted. I don't know if that's a good way to say it or not, but we, ought, we need to be challenged and be willing to be challenged. If our walk with God is not growing, perhaps it's because our view of him is obscured that we're not spending enough time sitting at his feet. You learn a lot about the Lord when you go through trials and difficulties. No one is immune from those things. No preacher is immune for, from them. No Christian is immune from the problems that come along with living in this world. But we learn a lot about, and I've had several conversations with preachers over the last several weeks with, uh, with concerns over, over different circumstances in, in our lives and others. And uh, in reiterating the, the concerns that, that, you know, it's easier to talk. And I had a preacher on the phone just yesterday, you know, praying for us, praying for our family. And he said, of course, all these things are that God knows best. That's easier for me to say than for you to hear right now, he said. And how true it is that it's easier to say what is true than to live what is true. As I often say, it's easier. Uh, every one of us can talk a better Christian life than we can live. But when, when faith, listen, if, if faith doesn't mean anything when we need it, 
It doesn't mean anything, anytime. If faith is not useful to us in times of burden and trial, then it wasn't really faith anyway. Faith is not a name tag that you pin on your lapel and say, see, I have faith. The Bible says, you show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Oh, it's things that we learn at the feet of Jesus. As we sit at the feet of Jesus, and we can expect these, the, the, the anticipation and the submission and the, and the relaxation, uh, three things happen. Number one, we see his face. Try to picture David as he sat before the Lord. As, as Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened. As we sit, when we sit before him to worship him, we see him, his glory and his grace. And that ties in with what the Lord has has been uh, emphasizing here uh, just this last week and over the last week that the more we see him, the more we are drawn to his likeness and the more like him we become. I have to, I have to uh, assume if the Bible says that it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. There's a connection with our view of him and our reflection of him. And I, have to, I have to suppose that if we are not being like him, perhaps it is because we do not have the view of him that we should. Because how can we sit at his feet and not be changed? How can we be Isaiah and not be moved and not see him when we see him high and lifted up, not see ourselves as a man of unclean lips. We see his face. Number two, we hear his word. Of course, as David and Mary, as others have, sat at the feet of Jesus. Jesus spoke and they heard his word. The most listen, we can speak to him, but more importantly, he speaks to us. What we have to say to him, he already knows, he wants to hear. Isn't it amazing that the God who knows everything still says, let your request be made known unto him? He still wants to hear it from you. Why? Because it's good for us to voice it to him so that we'll know where our supply comes from. It reminds us. It doesn't inform him. It reminds us. We hear his word. Our greatest need in our in the Christian life may be that we need to hear what God has to say. We need to hear what God has to say. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump over this here and get to this point. We need to hear why do we need to hear what God has to say? Well, look first of all, look in Psalm 85, the 85th Psalm. Psalm 85 and verse number 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace unto his people and to his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. We need to hear what God has to say. He's going to speak to us. And we need to make sure that we do not turn back. Why do we need to hear what God says? Because we often fail him. And because of that, we need to confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We need to hear what he has to say because there are times we think that he no longer, he must not love us like we thought. Because of the failures of our life, because of the problems in our life, we need to hear what he has to say because we sometimes will think that God has turned his back on us. And we need to hear what God has to say. Jeremiah 31, 3, the Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. God has loved us with an everlasting love. Number three, we need to hear what he has to say because we think we have committed some unpardonable sin. And we need to hear and rest upon the word of God. 
We need to be reminded from John 10, verse 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one, verse 30. We need to hear him because we think he has turned his back on us. We need to hear him in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. These verses are some of my go-to verses when people need to, need to know that God loves them and is with them. Verses 5 and 6 for the book of Hebrews chapter 13 <coughs> says this, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. We worry sometimes about the provision of our needs in the future. We need to hear what God says in Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. <coughs> we need to hear what he has to say because we wonder why God does not use us more. Why don't we see God moving more in our life? Why don't we see the answer to our prayer more? And we need to hear his reminder his encouragement in Galatians 6, 9, when he says, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We sometimes feel alone and forsaken when trials overwhelm us. I've spent a lot of time these last days in Psalms when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When fear comes over us, yea, will I trust in him? We need to be reminded and hear the words of the Lord in Isaiah 41, 10. Fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Oh, how we need to be reminded by hearing what Jesus has to say. By the way, as Brother Matt was just leading us in reading a few minutes ago. Wherefore, comfort one another. What? By saying, it'll be all right, don't worry about it. No. By saying, well, everybody has problems. It's come, the easy come, easy go. No. Comfort one another with these words. What were the words? The words were, there's going to be a shout. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming we listen. We are going to uh, we we, the, we uh, that live in Christ will not prevent them which are asleep. We're going to be called up together in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Hey, wherefore comfort one another with these words? You know the appropriate the appropriate comfort and encouragement for someone going through trials and problems is is not necessary. I know the Lord knows what's best, but the most appropriate comforting words are. Jesus is coming. And we're going to be with him forever. That's the, he said, comfort one another with these words. That means he intended these words to be salve on the wound. To be healing to the hurt, hurting. We need to be reminded over and over again, fear not. Because he's with us. There was a, in the uh, mid, mid to late 1800s, there was a British general. He's, uh, it's, it's, his, his story is an interesting story. He actually led, led, led uh, uh, groups of a, a Chinese-made army. Uh, and, and, and it was successful. Anyway, he, just, he has an amazing story. But they said about him that he was a very devout, committed Christian. He, uh, along with his military service, he, he uh, uh, did, uh, used all of his resources that he had uh, to house and feed and raise uh, orphan boys. Uh, his his uh, salary, I, I read his salary at the time, if you equate it to today's salary, would be around 400 pounds a year, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of six. 
hundred, uh, excuse me, four hundred thousand pounds a year. Be somewhere in the neighborhood of six or seven hundred thousand dollars a year, and over ninety percent of it, he gave away. Over over ninety percent he used in ministry to people. They said of this general that there was a a signal that all of his all of his troops and everyone under his command knew. That if they came to his room or they came to his tent in the field, if there was a white handkerchief hanging outside the doorway. It was for no reason where they'd interrupt him because he was in prayer. And his troops knew that no, no urgency, no, no emergency problem, no, no news, no, no uh, command, nothing coming down from above. Nothing was more important to that general than his time of prayer. So they would not disturb him. His name was General Gordon. Tremendous Christian and tremendous soldier in England. Oh, that we would have such a love for the Lord. Things like that ought to bring conviction in our heart and we ought to see how complacent we have become, how lethargic our Christian life is. And yes, I mean to challenge each of us in our walk with God because none of us is to the full extent of where we ought to be. None of us, as we see God, we see him more holy, we see ourselves less. As we lift him up, we are abased, but we need to stay at the feet of Jesus. And remember what we're talking about, worship before work. You see, if we get this perspective of Christ, love will take us farther than duty. We won't give up and quit when things get hard or other people uh, come and go or or fall by the wayside, whatever, we, because we weren't doing it for them, we're doing it for the Lord. Oh, how we need to have our walk with God develop. As I said, growing up, I was taught that children are to give reverence to their parents. But I, and I did it, you know, because you're supposed to do it. But at some point, my love for my parents grew to the place where I reverenced them even as an adult. When to this day, if my mom says I'd like for you to do something, I do everything I can to do it. Why? Because I love her. Love will always take us farther than duty or responsibility. What's lacking in our life is not knowledge. Everybody wants Bible studies this and Bible studies that. What needs to happen is we need to fall deeper in love with our Lord. And all of the rest of it comes along with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to impress on us this morning that while it is important that we work and that we labor, it is equally important that in our labor we find what we need to fall in love with the Lord, that we spend time at the feet of Jesus because love will take us farther than duty or responsibility. Our posture before the Lord needs to be sitting at his feet and when we sit at his feet, it brings peace because we know that he is, he is God and, and he's in control. It brings submission. It shows submission because we're sitting at his feet. You say, well, how do I do that? Listen, spending time in his word and spending time in prayer shows our submission to the Lord. And then an expectation. When we come to the word of God, we expect God to speak to our hearts. We expect it. I wonder if even coming to God's house today, if we came because we expected to hear from God or is it just time to come? Oh, listen, we need to come to God with an expectation. Father, I pray that you would help us today to, that you examine our lives, to let you bring us to an awareness of where we are, 
Lord, if our love is lacking, that we might recognize it and spend, and the remedy is to spend more time at your feet. Lord, because the more we know you, the more we will love you. The more we understand about what you've done for us, the more, the, the more deeply we will fall in love with you. And our service will be one not just of responsibility, but of love and desire. And God, I pray that each one of us here would grow in some measure because of this thought. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and our eyes still closed.